My name is Dustin Kelly, but everybody calls me DJ. I'm prior Army, serving as both a Ford Observer and a military police officer. I spent the last 14 and a half years as a police officer and detective in a large metropolitan police department. Two things that I've learned throughout my career. One, everybody has a story to tell. And two, the best stories are true. This is the DTD Podcast. In three, two, one, and we're live. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the DTD Podcast. This week in the studio, a man who joined the British Army at just 15 and a half years old. He even had to have his mother sign the paperwork because of his age. But don't be fooled by that. This guest has been there and done that, working with the Queen's Own Highlanders and the Joint Support Group as an advanced agent handler. He has worked covert, counter-terrorist, low-profile, close protection, and even anti-poaching operations. He's worked in countries like Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Cameroon, and even the United States. His 24-year career has placed him in numerous life-or-death situations where he learned there is nothing clean about field work, and in fact, mostly it's just plain messy. Please welcome the founder and CEO of GoNoisy.com, Neely Davis. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing really well. I'm doing really well. Thanks, guys. It's really great to be here. Very humbling. Yeah, and I just want to introduce uh, my co-host that comes in every once in a while, helping me this week, former male model, my friend and current badass, Chuck Ritter. All right, let's get into this. Fifteen and a half years old, you joined the British Army. I know you have a long history. Let's talk about the family coming up through the Great War, everything, up until you join at 15 and a half. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think... Um, I think we traced our our family back to the Great War. It probably goes on, maybe a little bit further back than that. But um, but the Great War, every every kind of male member of my family had served in the military, um, and then in more modern times, when I was a kid, you know, back in the sort of um, early seventies, half my family were army, half were navy, um, but nobody in the RAF, thank God. But it, it made it very interesting for family get-togethers, DJ, do you know? And as a as an eight or nine, ten-year-old kid, when and because my family were all serving, they were all deployed in places. Um, all the guys that served in the Navy, they all became submariners, funnily enough. So they were they were they weren't very they weren't home a lot, but when they did come home. Um, and at, at any family get-togethers, I would get the Navy guys pulling me to one side and kind of trying to recruit me into the Navy at the age of, you know, 10 years old. And then about an hour later, I would get the Army side of the family trying to recruit me into the Army. So I, I, it was never it was never in doubt that I was joining the military. The only thing that, that was in doubt was what service I would go into. So I, I I kind of I kind of chinned off school a little bit. Um I, I had no interest in it because I, I knew what I wanted to do. And they uh, and then when I was fifteen and a half years old, um my, my as as you as you introduced my mother in uh, God bless her, she um agreed to sign the papers to allow me to join. And I've, and I've joined in 90, uh, June 1982. Um, I went down to a place down the south of England called Infantry Junior Leaders Battalion in Shorncliffe and they, and spent a year uh, basic training. And they, I loved every single minute of it. But it was a different time back then, DJ, do you know? Um, I, mean, I mean, people talk about bullying and stuff like that. And I think back to, to 1982 and they... Uh, I mean, we got our ass handed to us every single day by our own, our instructors. But even to this day, I've, I've never really seen it as bullying. It was, I, I don't know what I would call it, but it certainly wasn't bullying. 
one one of the worst things that ever happened to me down there was, um, and it was my mother's fault. And I hadn't written home because I mean, we're talking 1982 here now. So, you know, no emails, no mobile phones, no nothing. If you wanted to phone home, you had to get a big a, a bag full of like 10 pence coins and then go to the pay phone and just keep chucking them in to phone. So I hadn't, um, I hadn't phoned home and I hadn't written home for about four months. And my mother was a little bit frantic. And as, as all, as all Scottish mothers do, the, um, uh, my mother was a, and she's she's just been she's dead now, just over a year. Uh, she she died last January, um, but she was a a big letter writer right up till her death. She was a letter writer. She she wrote letters, didn't type them out. She wrote letters, handwritten letters. Uh, it's kind of only after her death that I realised how cool that is. But anyway, she wrote a letter to the commanding officer of ILG uh, IGLB short clip. <laughs> And of course, shit goes down the way, DJ. So the commanding officer got in touch with um, my company commander. The company commander got in touch with the company sergeant major. The company sergeant major got in touch with my training corporal, who decided to come and speak to me about it at two o'clock in the morning after he'd been out drinking <laughs> all Saturday night. And he sat at the edge of my bed, and I can remember this as if it was yesterday. And this is this is long before you know the army had duvets and quilts and single rooms. You know, we were like in sixteen man rooms. Uh, we had you know a, a a solid sheet and a jaggy blanket. I mean, that's that's kind of what we had. And I woke up to him sitting at the edge of my bed. And it scared the shit out of me until I realised who it was. <laughs> and he, and he had said to me, he said, hey, "You you haven't phoned your mum, have you, Davis?" And it was the most bizarre thing to hear at two o'clock in the morning. I, 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 I didn't know what was going on. So he marched me down to the guard room. He was very drunk. I was very scared. Um, I, I was still in my shorts, and I get marched down to the guard room. Um, a, a particularly fast rate of marching. And I spent the next, I think maybe 14, 15 hours in the guard room, bumping the ceiling. And if you might not think that's possible, these old handheld bumpers that you used to, you used to get, you used to polish the floor. Well, we used to bump the ceiling with them. So I ended up bumping the ceiling, cleaning things that just didn't need to be cleaned and, uh, and then and and just getting beasted round the guard room until about eight nine the next morning, and then I had to go and write um, like two thousand times. Till I was back at school. I must call my mother. I must call my mother. So once I got all that down, I, I, I then got a a big bag full of of coins and and I went to phone my mother and she was so happy to hear me for about 20 seconds and then I kind of unloaded on her do you know do you know what the hell you've done mum do you know what you've done do you know what you've just put me through do you know because I wasn't homesick at all uh, not that I didn't miss my mother but um, I just wasn't homesick do you know and I was I, I was loving what I was doing and quite frankly phoning home was the last thing on my mind but um but yeah, I, I I loved that time. That was great. That was great fun down there. Great fun down there. Let me ask you about uh, you. You mentioned your mom, but I want to talk about your dad now. Your your actual biological dad left the family at about one years old, and then you had an adopted father that came in and adopted you. What at age six? But then yep. he unexpectedly died at nine, and so I've heard you talk about the men in your life, the role models in your life were these cousins and uncles that always talked about their service, the army, the Navy, things like that. Yep. How do you think that affected you in your career, not having a dad and then having a dad, but for a very short time? Uh, oh God, how long have you got? Um, 
<laughs> so I, th I think I should probably I think I should probably say um, I'm I'm not one of those people that 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 blame my own faults on my parents or on my childhood. I had a great childhood, do you know. I, I, I I've got no problems with my childhood, and my mother had done the best that she could. And um, uh, my father, my real father, left me, and I think I was about one. I've never met the man. And, they, and my sister met him years and years later and, and he asked if I wanted to meet him and I said no. By that time I was married, my career was going well, I had kids of my own. He'd never been in my life before, so it was like, well, what's he going to do now? So I, I, I believe he's dead now. Um, I, I, I don't feel anything about that, to be honest. Um, and then my, my, my mother married... Um, he married a guy that, that changed my life. He was only with us for three years, but he changed my life. And uh, and, and I miss him to this day. And, and, I, and I still get angry about the way he was taken. And um, he, he'd been married before and he had, he had older children. And my sister and I, my sister was three years older. So she must have been about 12 and we were staying over at my adopted father. He, because my real name's McCallum. My real name's Neil McCallum, and it was it was changed. And um, when I got adopted, it was it was changed. And uh, we were staying over at, at his older kids' house, his his daughter and and, and her husband, and my mother and, and and father. They were going to a dinner dance. There was there was Miss World competition was on that night, so um, my father uh, came in and he, he used to have this routine that he used to do with my sister and I. He used to call it Beardy Walla because he was he was at night time he wasn't shaven. He still had that that growth on him at night time, and he used to take his teeth out, and he would put the lights out in the bedroom, and he would crawl in on his hands and knees, and he would make these horrible monster noises. And he would come in and do beardy walla with his beard, and he would rub up against up and down, and it was just a thing that he did at night time. And and my sister and I, we did, we loved it, you know, we loved it. And that was the last thing he done. That was the last thing he done. I didn't see him again. And uh, um, um, him and my my mother went away to a dinner dance, and my sister and I sat with uh, our stepsister and her husband. We were watching Miss World and. I think it was Miss Venezuela. I think Miss Venezuela was particularly horrible, and you know we were all having a pretty, a pretty good laugh at Miss Venezuela's expense. And my sister and I went to bed laughing, and we 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 heard the phone rang, uh, ring, and um, that that's what kind of woke us up. At about I think about maybe two in the morning the phone rang, and. I, I I thought at the time it, 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 they were still laughing at, at, at Miss World, and, but that was them getting the news that George had died, their father, my father had died. So when we got up in the morning, we we didn't know this, and 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 that's when we were told. And I've always been, I've always been very bitter about it. I mean, I I, um, I mean to this day, I'm I'm very bitter about it. The way that. Um, do you know when you, you you don't get to say goodbye to people? I know that that happens to everyone, DJ. I and mean, I'm not I'm not you know I'm not going to go on Oprah and open up about it. But I'm just very very bitter about it. I had this man for three years and then and then he was gone. It, it it's funny because I'm I'm going to go back to a podcast that you did with um uh, with Zach, um uh, maybe about three or four weeks ago, and 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 Zach had um, Zach had more or less said that. You know, he was joining the army to die. He didn't really want to live because, he, you know, he, he had this stuff going on. And that was kind of my mindset as well. The, the, the death of this man affected me my whole life. Um, and, and even his funeral. He worked for a construction company in Glasgow, one of the biggest construction companies in Glasgow. And there must have been about... I don't know. I think my mother said over 2,000 people, something like that, that turned up at his funeral. 
and when we when we drove into the crematorium, the the um, the, the road up to the crematorium through the cemetery was lined lined with people people I'd never met before, but people that looked like my father because they they were they 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 had the same old overcoats that my father used to wear. And my father died at the age I am now, do you know? And, 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 and it was just so bizarre. And when we came back to the house and, my, and all my family were there and I was upstairs in bed and everyone was downstairs getting drunk. And they, and, and I can remember it because it woke me up, everybody laughing because my father had so many, he was loved so much by, by, the family that he joined, my family. He was very, very social. He had some great stories. He liked a little drink. And they, so there was all these stories being retold again. And you know what it's like when you tell a story at somebody's wake? The story gets embellished, you know, which is allowed. It's allowed. So I went downstairs not particularly happy that everybody was laughing and, and having a great time. And I was upstairs and my life had just kind of ended. I was I was devastated by, by everybody laughing. I didn't understand it. So uh, that was my sort of mindset. I, I wanted to join the army. I just, I, I didn't really care what happened to me. Um, I, I, and yet, you know, the worst injury I've ever had was breaking my ankle playing tennis. I mean, how, how embarrassing is that? And it's, I mean, and even when that happened, I had to lie to people and say it was something a little bit more, a little bit more macho, because I couldn't tell people that I broke my ankle playing games. You know, so it, that that plan didn't quite work out for me, uh, um, which which I'm glad now because I have I have four children, so I'm I'm glad now. My cousins, two cousins in particular, and their father. Were, were my role models. They they are the ones that that shaped me, guided me, advised me, um, gave me a slap around the head when I was misbehaving. When they came home and leave, and my mother told them, they would come in and they would they, they would give me a, a, a good slapping, and they uh, and, and yeah and, and I, I I I kind of loved that about them, you know the, the way they they they. they they kind of took that job on. You know? Well, you had three choices that you wanted to do for the military. You uh, had helicopter door gunner, EOD, or infantry. Was your uh, <laughs> that, That's what you said you wanted to do. Uh, that's right. Chuck, I want to kind of mix you into this one. Um, when you talk about that and when you talk about you joined at 15 and a half, you really didn't know what you wanted to do. Chuck, you were a little older when you did. Uh, Neely, how did the military change your life in another direction? Because you said like when your father died, uh, that, that devastated your world. Then you joined the military with this thought that you're going to go forth and do all this good. Did it change your perspective at all? Or did it maybe drive you a little harder? It changed my whole, it changed my whole mindset on everything. The army, the, the, the army. And I didn't, I didn't know it until I joined. I think the army was was in. It was what I needed. It was what I wanted, and it's very, very very rarely do you get a job that you actually want and need. But I have never been a very confident person at school. I was never very confident. Um, I used to get bullied at school, and they, uh, and I wanted, I, I wanted to find out what I was like. I wanted to put myself, you know, get myself out my comfort zone. And, and and following the footsteps of of all these guys who had who had served in the military, you know, during the the First World War, the Second World War, the Falklands War, Northern Ireland, I, I wanted to to. I think I wanted people to be proud of me. I think that's kind of what I wanted. I wanted to be the next generation of people that um, uh, that joined the military, so that perhaps my kids or somebody else's kids would would keep on doing that but the, the army changed my, my entire life it changed it gave me new perspective it, it it educated me 
but in a both in, in both a non-academic and an academic way, it educated me. And I think a lot of people don't they don't really real, realize that that in the military they, they they do educate you both academically and non-academically. And I would never have got that at school if I'd stayed on at school because I had no interest. But being in the army and being educated by the army was completely different, and I and I loved it. I, I my appetite it was almost as if I got I got this appetite for learning stuff. But I was a very very slow learner. I was never in the top of my class at anything, anything, all the way through my and not until I, I got maybe into my thirties. I I never um, I never really excelled at anything. I was always in that sort of you know that maybe that top third of a class, do you know, um, and I always thought that that was that was where I was going to end up, just a a career of mediocrity, which which used to scare me somewhat because I had this I had this idea. I wanted I wanted my mother to be proud of me. I wanted my family to be proud of me. I wanted to do great things, and it, it was only as I got older, maybe into my late twenties, that I realized I loved soldiering. I loved it. Um, you know, being out in the field, crawling through rivers, doing infantry tactics, section attacks, platoon attacks, going down to breaking at ITC Wales, or traveling to Canada or Kenya to do live firing or going to Belize to do live firing, to do jungle training. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It was like my calling. And they, and, and then after that, it, it just went from strength to strength. So you didn't you didn't figure that out until your 20s, though? In my late 20s, Chuck. Yeah, in my late 20s. I, did, I didn't know where I was going or what I wanted to do. So when I joined up, and you talk about the, the three choices that you get, you know, door gunner um, and, and an EOD operator, because I'd seen them on the television. But the recruiting sergeant, you know, a very old school recruiting sergeant, um, it just more or less just disregarded that and says, "No, son, you're going to the infantry," and that was it. But um, but so so when I when I joined, you got three choices: how long you want to serve for, um, or sign on for initially, three years, six years, or nine years. So I had been told my my, my these these male family members had told me. That um, if you do join the military, then understand that you're you're doing your 22 years. You understand that you're not doing six, and you're not doing 12, and you're doing 22 because we've all done 22. And it was like Jesus Christ. So I signed on for nine years, but that nine years didn't didn't kick in until I was 18 years old. So by the time I was 27. <laughs> I know it's like prison. So when I did, when I'd say, <clears throat> so when I, yeah, I was twenty-seven years old. I think I'm trying to think what rank I was. Maybe corporal. I think when I was twenty-seven, maybe corporal. So I, I had done my junior NCOs qualifications down at ITC Wales um, at Brecon, which we all have to go through, and it was, it was around that time that. I realized how much I loved being a soldier and, and 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 how much I wanted to sort of test myself out because at that time you know we, we only had Northern Ireland. That's that's what we that was our operational training ground, I suppose. And that wasn't really soldiering. Not really. That was patrolling around a a, a British city um being shot at and blown up by people that look exactly like you. That's that for me that wasn't soldiering. Although it was a lot of fun and it was a you know, these these moments of adversity, these these um, um little things that happen to you, they, they they kind of they help you understand, they 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 change your outlook on on, on things, you know, because we can all talk about what we you know if this happens or if that happens or if this happens, what would we, what would we do in that situation? And then it happens 
and you do the exact opposite because you've really got no clue until it does happen to you. So again, non-academic education serving in Northern Ireland for him. Oh God, I think I spent, I, I think I must have spent 15 of my, uh, of my 24 years in Northern Ireland. I, as a green army soldier or as a, as a, as an undercover one later. Well, let's talk about uh, being part of the Queen's own Highlanders. Now, is it true that their nickname is the Blue Mafia? It was. It was. It was. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So was we, we got to go into these guys because, I mean, with a nickname like that, and their motto was help the king. So it feels to me like they'll do anything to help the king. Well, it was. It was. Uh, so it was save the king. Yep, save the king. But, you know, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I could sit here and give you some bullshit story about where Blue Mafia comes from. I've got no idea. <laughs> I've got no idea. And I could. And the thing is, I probably could give you some bullshit story. But if this goes out live and I share it on social media, people will listen to it and go, that's not what it's called. So I, do, I don't know why it's called the Blue Mafia. But it's um, it was an absolutely fantastic regiment just full of absolute rogues, rogues. And they, and if the, the funny thing about, well, it's not the funny thing, it's something that I actually, I actually, I actually, now that I'm older, I look back on it, I, I, I see the importance of it. But when I was, when I was serving in the Queen's Own Highlanders, I hated it. And that's the tradition. So the, the Queen's Own Highlanders goes back it, it, it's two. It's two amalgamated regiments: the Seaforth Highlanders and the and the, the Cameron Highlanders, and, and and who were two Scottish regiments in their own right, going right back to the First World War, and then they were amalgamated. So, I mean, it goes back right to the Battle of Waterloo. So there's a, there's lots of traditions in a Scottish regiment. Each company has its own pipe tune. Uh, and when you ever got promoted into the, the, the warrant officers and sergeant's mess, the regimental sergeant major, the RSM, would, um, you know, uh, uh, during a dinner night, and uh, these very formal dinner nights, and he would tell everybody, okay, everybody from Delta Company, stand up when you hear your company tune. Honestly. They could have played Happy Birthday on the pipes. I would never have known my company tune. I had no interest in my company tune. So I just stood up for every pipe tune. I just stood up. And I was going up and down. I was like a gopher, just standing up and down, standing up and down. And of course, every time you get it wrong, the RSM finds you a, a, a bottle of port or something. I think I might have maybe owed the Sam's mess about six bottles of port during, during dinner nights. But it, it, it was it, that kind of stuff used to, I'm going to say it used to bore me. And that sounds really disrespectful, and I don't mean to be to, to serving and in, in, uh, people who have served in the, in the Queen's Own Highlanders and to the regiment itself. I, I don't mean, I don't say that in a, in a disrespectful way. I say it in a way is that I hated being in barracks. I hated the, the formality of being in barracks. And Scottish regiments are very formal in barracks. We we had about a half dozen different types of dress where we would wear tartan trues or kilts or maybe it was combat gear, but it was always something on different days. It would be something. And I had really had no time for that. I, I wanted to get out and soldier. I didn't really care too much about, promote, about, about being promoted. I, 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 I didn't want to become somebody who was in charge of, in charge of other people. That, that wasn't really my call. That eventually happened, but it happened more by default than it did. It wasn't any conscious decision. And I always had this very disturbing assumption of what, what happens to a person when they get promoted and they go into the, the warrant officers and sergeants' mess Certainly in the British Army, 
People change, DJ. And I can remember so many of my friends who one day we're walking through camp in a pair of jeans and, and T-shirts and we're talking about normal stuff that soldiers talk about. The next day, this, you know, they, they get promoted and they've got cords on. They're wearing cords. And they've got a, maybe a, a flannel shirt on. And you call them by their first name and it's Corporal Davis. You, you, you need to start calling me, you know, Sergeant McDonald now. It's like, what? Why? Well, because I'm a, I'm a sergeant now. And it's like, oh, fuck off. <laughs> so, and then everybody, everybody that joined the sergeant's mess, suddenly everybody played golf. These, these guys, these guys never took, these guys never talked about golf at any point in their lives. And then the next day after they joined the, the one officers in sergeant's mess, they're cutting around like Jack Palmer, you know, and it's like, well, where, where did you get all that stuff from? And they're and they're, they're playing golf and they're and I never signed up to that. So when I get promoted into the sergeant's mess, I was probably the biggest non-conformist. And I made two promises to myself: if I ever get into the sergeant's mess, I would never wear cords, and I would never play golf ever. And I broke both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I broke both of them, but um, um, only the golf thing. The golf thing was different. The golf thing. I was on an undercover job in Northern Ireland, and they, and we were doing a job on a golf course somewhere. And they, I'd never played golf in my life. I mean, I'd never played golf in my life. So we got all this golfing gear, and we um, we were doing a recruiting job of a guy, and. Um, him and the the let's just call him the recruiter. They were a um, they were a hole ahead of us. Uh, we were behind them, and we had another another team of golfers in front of them. And the only person that could play golf in that whole team was the the recruiting guy. Uh, the rest of us the rest of us couldn't play golf. So we were we were pulling our golf carts. Um, our golf trolleys. I had a G3 in mine. I had a G3 in it, and one of those golf socks that you put on a on a on a five iron, so so, so it was hidden. So I, I had my golf clubs, and then my G3 in, in a in a in a golf trolley, and we just played golf, but we didn't play golf very well. But that was so that was that was the only time that I, I broke that promise. But, hey, you're talking about the difference between like a corporal and a sergeant, but there's a huge difference over there between officers and enlisted, right? There's a big, like a gap almost, as far as I understand it, that we don't, we don't really see in the US Army. And we do, but not to the extent. I think, I think Chuck, it's more of a, it's more of a, a, a of a formal gap. So as, as a platoon sergeant, my job was to, let's say mentor a new, a new platoon commander. So somebody that, that hadn't been to Sandhurst yet, they had they were a second lieutenant, and they uh, they hadn't done their uh, their 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 uh, officers tactical courses anything like that. So they come in very very young, they come in very naive, very inexperienced, and very nervous. And they, you know, I I, I was never I, I was. I've never, I've never been one to shout and scream at somebody. I have on occasion, um, but when when you're teaching somebody, when you're trying to mentor somebody, shouting and screaming and and it just it doesn't cut it. It just it doesn't help. I would probably say that ninety five percent of the of of any new officers that came in. Um, we, we, I, I always really had a good relationship with them. There was one that I didn't have, and then we re we really clashed to the point where um, I was almost getting moved out that platoon. We met up again years and years later, and he he actually apologised to me, and uh, 
and and said that how much he 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 didn't really appreciate what I was trying to teach him and and stuff like that. But it, I suppose it depends on what regiment you join in the British Army. So if you join any any household cavalry or the guards, the guards division. Now I'm not I'm not saying they're not good officers. I mean there there are some some amazingly talented officers out there with the uh, uh, you know who get the the respect of their men, the love of their men sometimes. Um, but they come from a completely different class of people. But then you get the, the perhaps the officers that join the Queen's Own Highlanders or the Parachute Regiment or the Royal Marines. Sometimes they're a little bit more grounded. Perhaps they don't come from the same that same class of people. And I, 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 I know that people always speak badly of officers. I've never really been one to do that. I, I can speak uh, uh, well or badly of all ranks that I've served with, whether they be junior NCOs, senior non-commissioned officers or officers. There's a, there are dicks everywhere, let's just say that. I don't think rank really makes makes a difference, you know, for him. And and I always believed in that in that hierarchy a little bit. I always I always believed that. And and DJ, going back to that question you asked me about twenty minutes ago about you know how the army changed me, it it kind of gave me order. And I and I I, I kind of relished that a little bit. I liked I liked that autocratic order that the army gave you. I I quite liked that. I, I, I liked to be told what to do and then to do it, but to do it well. I've, I've always really enjoyed that. And as I've got older, I've, I've found that um, I still like doing that to the point where I really struggle with delegation, you know, delegating, delegating things down to other people. I really struggle with it. And it's um, it's definitely a lack of trust that 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 they'll get the job done properly. But that's that's one of my many faults, DJ. One of my many faults, I'm afraid. Well, I have two questions that came from Chuck saying that. One, when you you talked about uh, when you taught people that you uh, never were a yeller, didn't do anything like that, it didn't do any good. One, do you think that that went back to your education and your learning, that you learned that at a very young age, that the yelling, the stuff, that didn't help you at all, and it didn't help you to learn, so you passed it forward on that? And then number two, when you talk throughout your career about all the things that you've done and having that, that standard every day that never really changes, do you find that you struggle outside of the military, and um, um, so I'll answer the the last part of that question quite simply. Yes, quite simply, yes. And um, the first part of it um, about the shouting and screaming, I I didn't really learn that. I wasn't really in a position to shout and scream at people. I didn't I didn't hold the rank, not really, until I I I went down and I done what we would call in the British Army junior breaking. Um, so we go down to um, the Infantry Training Centre at Brecon in Wales. And we're down there for about um, oh, about 16 weeks. Um, uh, well, it was it was then. I don't know what it is now. You, you do your skill at arms side of it, and then you do your tactics side of it. And then with that, you become... Um, and there's different levels where you can do you can do junior breaking, and then when you get promoted to corporal, and you get a little bit of experience under your belt, you then go and do seniors, um, and it's the same thing but a, a, a higher rank. So on junior breaking, you're um, you're being you're being assessed as a section commander. So you know a, a junior NCO in charge of a section of eight. Um, but you all you also get assessed as a platoon sergeant because that's how the British Army works. We work one up. So um, my instructor down there, and I won't say his name, but I remember his name. 
um, vividly. I remember who he was vividly. He was the worst instructor that I'd had up to that point and that I've ever had ever since. He was awful. He didn't, um, he didn't encourage anybody. He didn't instill any sense of take pride in what you do, guys. He didn't, he didn't teach tactics from a position of experienced based teaching. Um, because he, he, and, and he shouted, he, he screamed, he was petty and it was a most unenjoyable course. And it was winter and winter in Wales was torture. So, and I passed that and, and I passed it pretty well. And, and I remember, remember saying to myself on the drive home, we had a, 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 there was, we were in Germany at the time. So I drove home with a friend of mine um, and we drove all the way to Germany from him, uh, from Wales. And I can remember saying to him, if I ever come back here as an instructor, if I'm an instructor anywhere, I, I am never being like that guy. I am never being, I didn't, nothing, I, I, I didn't, he didn't um, enthuse me. I, I, I was doing it for me. That's what I was doing it from. And then funnily enough, I went down. I didn't, I didn't stay a corporal long. I think I, I only stayed a corporal for about three years. And uh, and I went down to seniors. Uh, same course where we you, where you get assessed as a platoon sergeant, but also as a platoon commander. And you get given command appointments and stuff like that. And I had probably one of the best instructors I've ever had in my life. I mean, the contrast was just, I, I just amazing. He he made people want to learn. He talked about tactics in a very informal way. He he instilled that hunger to take take pride in in the trade craft of being a, a an infantry soldier, and he taught me. And not me personally, but although that's what I took from it. But he taught me how it's the small details that matter. It's not the big, it's not the big things. It's the small details. It's the personal skills. It's your your personal skills that matter, because as a leader of men, they're watching those little things. They're watching how you administer yourself in the field. You're watching how you square, you square away your gear when it's been pouring a rain for five days and it's minus seven. They're watching that you don't wear gloves in the winter when you're handling your rifle. They, they watch that you are getting up for your stag at two o'clock in the morning, even though you don't have to because you're in charge. They're watching how you clean your weapon before you, you put your you put your your MREs on. That's what they're watching. And that's that's what this guy taught me. This guy taught me that, you know, to be a good leader, to be a good soldier, there are there are things that you sacrifice. And one of those things is you sacrifice your own comfort for the comfort of others, especially those who are following you, who who you want them to follow you. There's people, and he taught me that people don't follow you. People will follow you if they're forced to follow you, you know, because you're in charge and that's their job. They'll follow you, but they won't follow you. Do you know? They won't, not in, the, not in that same way, they won't follow you. And that's what this guy taught me. This guy's name, and I'm going to say his name, this guy's name was Brian McNabb. Uh, and that that guy, that guy sort of was was responsible for my uh, well for for kind of where I am now with in regards to how I teach and 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 what's important to me, the little details.
the little small stupid details that everyone thinks are easy, but they're not. Not when you've got 12 guys behind you watching you. Because it's easy when you're in a position of authority, when you're in a position of command, it's easy to kind of think that the normal rules don't apply to you, that the things that you're that your men do, that you don't have to do. It's easy to do that. I know a lot of guys that, that, that fell into that trap because, well, I'm in, I'm in command, therefore I don't need to do this and that and this. And I understand that when you get to the, the dizzy heights of perhaps, you know, full bird colonels or, or two and three star generals, but not as a sergeant. Not as a staff sergeant, not as a first sergeant, not as a company sergeant major, not as a platoon commander. Because you're in the dirt with the rest of the guys. That's where that's that's where you are. That's your job. That's you're there with them, and and they've got to see you do what they do. Because that's 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 how people follow you. So Brian McNabb taught me that. I don't think I ever I ever I can't remember ever meeting him again. I, I owe him quite a lot, so um, and, I'm, and I'm and I'm glad to 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 um, give his name out there. If other people listening to this know, hey, I got a, I got a quick question for you. You said the small things. Now, starting out in the infantry, I was also in the infantry for a while. One of the things that I found was no amount of sexy techniques ever trump the basic infantry doctrinal doctrinal fundamentals that have carried me through everything and yep. with your company too, would you say that that's your observation? Yep, absolutely. I mean, you've just, you've just hit a nerve now with me here, Chuck. So one, one of the things that has really ripped my knitting for about the last 25 years has been um, the use of cover. I lose my mind. And um, when I see stuff on social media of the use of cover and how people don't use it correctly. And, and I think to myself, they're either being really lazy or maybe they haven't been taught properly, or maybe they've just never been in a gunfight, but their use of cover is atrocious. And, and I see it more often than, than I, I think I should see it. So on, on, on just about all of the courses that, that, uh, that we run, we always spend time with use of cover. And we generally find that people will say to us, this is really hard. It's like, well, it's supposed to be hard because you've got to make it hard for the people trying to kill you. You've got to make it hard. It's it's easy to to not use cover. You know, you throw on uh, you know throw on a set of cries, throw on an SF helmet, stick a set of quads on there, get all the all the the stuff on your rifle, and you can run around the range and you can do all the bullshit that you want to do. But a lot of people get blinded by that because they just see the gear. Oh, and a beard. You've got to have a beard. You got to look that's, cool, that, right? Number, number one a, rule. That's a prerequisite. A beard. All right, let's, and, let's be careful and, about and, the beard, Tom. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and also, also um, rolled up sleeves, but mm -hmm. gloves on, because that makes sense. So, <laughs> so you get, so you get the, you know, all, all that training going on. But when you look at it, when you deep, when you deep dive into the tactics that they're doing, the use of cover, because it's not cool, because it's not sexy, it's something, it's probably the, the biggest thing that is overlooked in all tactical training. All tactical training, it's, well, it's overlooked. Not, it's not sexy, right? I mean, and the reality is, in what I found in combat, most of the time, you're in a very uncomfortable position, trying to get your ass shot off, trying to figure out where you're getting shot at, for one, and then you're in this small, trying to make yourself extremely small and shooting from something that is almost impossible. Yeah. 
Yep. I mean, forget about all those all those um, standard fire positions, you know, kneeling, prone, uh, squatting, sitting position. They just, they, they, they kind of don't work because um, you never get, you never really get a bit of cover that, that um, not in real life, you never really get a bit of cover that allows you to do that. So, and then you, but you find a fire position that works for you and you, that, and that is dictated by the cover because your fire position is dictated by the cover. I had a friend of mine out here, and I, I'm just going to digress a little bit. As a friend of mine out here, we had a, a not we, not not my company, but but this facility. There was a local, and I won't say what um, uh, what uh, police department they came from, what county they came from, but there was a, a PD SWAT team came out. And they were doing tactical training in the prison here. So they asked them. They asked my my, uh, my friend to um, to play the role of the the hostage, and they were going to do whatever it is the SWAT team did. Now this guy Jimmy, I've called him Jimmy. Jimmy had has been on numerous courses with me, numerous. And, and understands very well. And he's a civilian. He's not. He's not. He's not military. He's not ex-police. He's 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 a big shooter, but especially a long-range shooter. And they never hit him once. And out of a out of a SWAT team of sixteen, he smoked twelve of them. And they were using they were using some munition. And it, the, he was just he was hitting them, you know, a, a blue 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 blue, just hitting them all the time. And he was using the use of cover from inside the building. And that's all he was doing. That's all he was doing. And when they came when they came out after the debrief, they asked him, have, have, have you had any military training? And he said, and he said, no, I've, I've just trained with Neely Davis at Go Noisy. And they weren't very, they, well, they weren't very pleased because they get so many police officers had get, just got smashed because their use of cover was awful. It was awful. Do you know when you stand up behind a car and you and you stand over the over the, the roof of a car? It's just like, do you know you know I can see your whole body, right? You know I can see that you're there through the glass windows. You understand I can see that. And it's just that concept of of and I was always taught you, you should never fire over cover. You should always fire round it. If you can, Afghanistan was different because of you know sometimes sometimes on a in a um, you know in a in a wadi or a riverbed you you could only fire over. But that being said, you're not going to stay in the same place. You're going to you're going to pop up. You're going to fire you know you know five six seven rounds. Then you're going to get back down again. Run about seven yards down the wadi. Come back up somewhere else. Because if you just sit there and just and just pull the trigger and just pop off shots, you're not going to survive that. And that was that was something that that Brian McNabb taught me when we were doing infantry tactics. He goes, "You can't you can't lie still. You will not survive it because once they know where you are, they will just pummel that place with rounds." And then, and we we also learned that in, in Northern Ireland um, on patrol, they. The IRA were were um, they were a very skilled terrorist organisation. I think I think during the I think during the seventies and the eighties that that two decades that twenty years you know with apart maybe from the LTTE apart maybe from the Tamil Tigers maybe the IRA were probably if they had a top five Oscars award for the best terrorist organisation the IRA would be up there. I mean they were they were. They were very, very good at what they did, even though they were all a bunch of scumbags. But the IRA used to, um, on street corners, they would put very discreet marks. You know, I'm not talking like a chalk mark with a big X. It's nothing like that. But they would put very discreet marks at head height and at kneeling head height because that those were the two sort of, positions that soldiers when they went round a corner or if they took up a fire position at the corner 
of a of a street or of a building we would generally stand or we would generally kneel down and they'd all be talking to each other on on radios or or something like that and they so they kind of knew that, that we were coming also when you when you walked around the corner you would you would, you would just get smacked you know and some of them some of them were as close as 100 meters away the gunmen the firing point some of them were as far away as maybe 400 meters depending on on you know on what part of the of west belfast that you were you were patrolling around so that that use of cover was was hammered was hammered home just to about every single British soldier that served in Northern Ireland. And we kind of understood, maybe maybe better than most, and certainly perhaps maybe better than this generation, perhaps, that um, bullets go through shit. Do you know? Um, brick walls. Bullets go through brick walls. Um, uh, and... and the, the the IRA went through a period of time where they were they would their weapon of choice eventually became the the Armalite, um, the, the you know um, Vietnam era Armalites, but they had lots of AKs, they had lots of um, Russian made weapons, Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern European uh, weapons, and they they would slice through a lot of cover, you know. So we 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 kind of learned that lesson pretty damn quickly about use of cover and it's it's just you talk about the basics of soldiering chuck using cover correctly is probably the one thing that's going to keep you alive in a firefight you know i had this argument with a guy on on social media the other day and i know that i shouldn't i know i shouldn't you know i'm too old for it but some guy mentioned or, a, or not one of my posts some guy was talking on a, on a post about how it's um, it's it's important that you count your rounds in a firefight, and I, and I and I, I I kind of commented that well your 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 comment clearly clearly indicates you've never been in one, you know. So that that use of cover thing for me is is if you can't get that right, you're not going to survive a gunfight. If you can't get it right, it doesn't matter how slick your drills are doesn't matter how quickly you can transition to your pistol or how quickly you can do a speed change. If you can't get use of cover done properly, you're not surviving a firefight. It's as simple as that. You know, and and when I see people resting their weapons on the on the, the sides of walls and stuff like that, or I just think, yeah, yeah, you've just you've never been taught anything better, I think. Let, let me ask you a question, Neely, about your career, okay? Because you, uh, of course, we've had the GWAT um, since 2001. It became a, a very big focus, counterterrorism. You were working counterterrorism a long time ago against the IRA. So you've seen a couple of different uh, kinds of conflict throughout your career. If you had to pick the the toughest or the 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 one that you had to get ready for the most what do you think that would be afghanistan northern ireland was um absolutely best job in the world um i mean i mean people when i, I worked for an organization it was a, it was a, a tri-service organization and um, it was it was mostly mostly made up of of, of army but it was tri-service very small unit and we had different what we call debts um, around uh, Northern Ireland. I won't say where, but we had them around Northern Ireland. And we were completely autonomous. Um, when I say autonomous, I don't I don't mean we were rogue. That was um, that happened back in the seventies when you had all these rogue elements, the MRF and, and the SRU and stuff like that. Um, but you know, in the in the in the late 80s 90s it all started to get a little bit more gentlemanly but agent handling and and, and i mean i'm sure you guys understand that, that northern ireland that us british don't like to call things a war do you know we like to call things different names like the falklands conflict um northern ireland was called the troubles it's like the troubles it's almost like you're talking about your neighbor 
your neighbours, you know, oh yeah, do you know what? John and Trudy are having some trouble with their marriage. That's kind of how we we we, we talked about thirty years of of terrorism in Northern Ireland. You know the troubles because nobody wanted to call it a war. According to the IRA, it was a war, and according to us, informally, it was a war. It was, I suppose, it was the it was our war on terror. Do you know? And I, certainly, as a as a as a Green Army soldier. I mean, I know people talk about IEDs and, and landmines and booby traps in Afghanistan and Iraq. But we, we were getting the shit blown out of us in Northern Ireland from, from you know, 1969 right up to, oh, well, when I, I stopped going there as a Green Army soldier in 94, do you know? And we were getting ied we were getting rpg we were getting mortared. I mean, mortared on the streets of Great Britain. Uh, and these and the IRA, these IRA, these these geniuses, the mortars that they built, all homemade mortars. Um, they made their own landmines. They made their own IEDs. They used different systems of initiation. You know, um, remote control, trip wire. Uh, uh, um, command wire. Uh, they even used camera flashes. I mean, you name it. They 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 thought it up. And they and a and a and a never and a, a never ending amount of money. Uh, and a never ending amount of arms. Um, unfortunately, from the USA. Um, I mean, the US, the USA. I think from about. Maybe about 1979, maybe earlier than that, mid 70s, certainly right up to the end of the 80s. At the USA was the IRA's biggest funder of arms and weapon, uh, arms and and money. Do you know? So we um, and it's funny because you know I, I mean people talk about you know where were you on 9/11. I was on a job in Northern Ireland in nine eleven. I was on a job. I was in a in a hotel bar, and um, it came on the television. Um, and later that day, the we had. I'm just trying to word this properly. We were able to monitor. Um, an office frequented by the leadership of of uh, the Republican movement in Northern Ireland, and when nine eleven happened, these um, leadership figures sat with each other and said, "That's it. It's all over." And they talked about well, somebody. Somebody asked, "Well, what do you mean by that?" I said it's all over. We we will from this point on. We're not going to get any any more money, any more arms, nothing from America. And and they were right, um, because you know I think that's when America realised that that all terrorism was bad, because through the seventies and eighties. Um, the terrorism in Northern Ireland was 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 being funded. It was being supported. Um, they even named a street in New York after a multiple murderer, IRA guy. Um, the U.S. government wouldn't extradite. Uh, that's why the um, IRA guys, when they went OTR, when they went on the run, they would uh, get themselves to America because America um, seen them as political and not terrorists. They refused to extradite them. 9-11 changed all that. 9-11 changed all that. I had I had this talk in Afghanistan years and years later when um, uh, I was on a fob um, with the 82nd Airborne and we, there was a, we, were, we were having a, a, 
you know, we'd went to church and stuff and we were, we were, we were having a service for 9-11, a Remembrance Day for, for 9-11. And the colonel walked round afterwards and I'd, I'd been there for a, well, I'd, I'd been with the 82nd Airborne for, for, for about nine months at that point. Or should I say they'd been with me for nine months because I'd been there for about four years before that. And the colonel walked up to me and he, and he, and he said, well, so what does 9-11 mean to you, Neil? And I said, well, truthfully, sir, 9-11 to me was when, when America realised that, that all terrorism was bad. And I, I, I explained to him what I've just explained to you guys. But I, I didn't find I didn't find undercover work in Northern Ireland hard. I loved it, and as a as a as a, a Glaswegian from Scotland, because the the job that we were doing there was it was properly covert. I mean, people talk nowadays about about covert ops, and it's like. You know that 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 entire word covert has, over the years, in my opinion, been diluted down to something that doesn't even resemble covert. An SF job helicopter into a compound somewhere in southern Afghanistan to go and, you know, either snatch somebody or kill somebody. That's not a covert op. That's a that's a that's an op with, with opsec before you go out. But as soon as you put boots in the ground, as soon as those choppers land, it stops becoming covert. And you leave trace. Again, not covert. And generally the result of these operations would be to either, as I say, put somebody down or take somebody with you. So again, not covert because you've left a footprint there. That's not what we did. We were a passive intelligence gathering operation with the capacity to go aggressive if we ever needed to. But man, you had to have a good reason to go noisy because you would not only compromise yourself, you would compromise the job. We would never, ever, would, oh, that's not true. That's not true. We would have never, ever. It would need to be something really, really bad for us to, to step out of our cover story. So we, we all had cover stories. I had three identities. I had three driving licenses, three credit cards, three passports. I had a deep cover story that was checkable. I lived in the local community, the community that I was working in, and that's what we did. Well, and we, so, well, let me ask you about that because you've said that a, a couple times about covert and undercover operations. When you talk about that and you say Afghanistan was the hardest thing to prepare for, what made it so different? If you're working in a passive condition, because let me let me speak from a law enforcement perspective or an undercover perspective or covert. When you work as law enforcement in undercover, you're doing a certain position, your narcotics, your vice, you're doing something where you're doing that repetitiously uh, throughout your whole time there. With you guys, you were intelligence gatherers. So I look at it as whether you're working undercover, covert in Afghanistan, Cameroon, Africa, Iraq, you're still doing the same kind of job. So what makes it difficult from country to country? Understanding the the, the barefaced answer, which is you don't fit in, which is a big part of undercover. But why did Afghanistan stick out so much more than these other countries? So I've never been... I, I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I was undercover in Afghanistan or undercover in Libya or undercover in Iraq uh, uh, because it's impossible. Well, well, no, that's not true. It, uh, that's not true. You can false flag. Governments do that really well. You know, um, the amount of people that I met in Afghanistan that worked for USAID, and it's just like, yeah, okay, I'm sure you do work for USAID. But it, so that I mean, you, you've you've got that sort of um, that kind of cover. But in, in Northern Ireland, it was it was it, 
it's probably undercover work at its purest. I mean, we're talking about infiltrating terrorist organisations and Martin McGuinness, the... Um, Martin McGuinness was a, a, a... He was probably one of the most evilest men within the IRA ranks. Nothing happened. Nobody got killed. No operation took place. Nobody got executed without Martin McGuinness's say-so. That's common knowledge. I'm not, I'm not giving away any secrets here. That's common knowledge. Everyone that kind of knows about Northern Ireland. And he's, he's on record, he was on record that saying that the, one, of the, one of the IRA's main aims was to capture um, an agent handler, a British intelligence agent handler, to capture them, interrogate them, and um, obviously execute them in the most horriblest of ways. Because it was the one thing that the IRA were terrified about was what they called informers in their organisations. We never called them that. We never. I've never used the term informers. It's a very for me. It's um, it's too disrespectful. It doesn't give these these men and women that did it enough enough respect. Some of them were scumbags. Um, some of the, the, the certainly the people that I recruited and that I ran, they were scumbags. Um, some of them were, and but they all, and they all had different different reasons for doing it, different motivational factors. It wasn't all about money. Sometimes it was something else. But the pressure that they lived under was i mean if i thought i was under pressure you know living in the same community the pressure that they were under because they were either in those organizations or they were on the periphery of those organizations that pressure that's daily that's daily and i don't i don't think i'm i don't think i'm crossing the line here i don't think i am by cross because i'm not going to give names or anything like that I ran three sources, all from the same family, husband, wife, uncle. And none of them knew that each of them was a source. And it was, it was the most difficult thing whenever we went to meet them or they came to meet us. And we had different ways of doing that. So for, for any listeners that think that how you meet a how you meet a source or a, a covert human intelligence source to give them their proper name, but how you meet a chiz, you, you don't meet them in a cafe and sit and slide over something across the table. You don't, you, that, that gets them killed and that gets me killed. We had tradecraft and mechanics that would blow your mind how we, how we got those people under control different ways of doing it, walking, on foot, on foot and walking. We had the most, oh, it was just genius, genius. Um, I, but, but it was done for a reason. It was done to protect the, to, to protect the agent, you know, so there was lots of um, clearing of stuff. There was lots of counter surveillance and, and, and stuff like that. There was lots of switching cars and switching plates and vans and, uh, I mean, just crazy. Uh, very, very, initially very difficult to, to plan and conduct. But once once I'd been doing it for a few years, it was just like second nature. But this, this husband and wife and, and uncle was uh, the most bizarre thing. And I would... Uh, I, I would be sitting speaking to the husband and he would and after we after we we talked about work we would um, we would go through certain other things with him you know we'd find out about his welfare would find out about other things going on and and these guys and girls they were very very personal with us you know they told us about their medical condition um, um about their medical problems I, I had one guy that had um, a Peroni's disease and they decided to to pull his Johnson out 
in the debriefing room and show me because I'd asked him, well, what's wrong with it? And he told me, well, it's a it's a little bit bent. So I was like, well, let me see it. And he and he pulled it out for me and and, and you know, and we and we and we kind of discussed that. Um although it made it made for some interesting writing the intelligence report at the end. But this this other guy would would say to me, I think I think my wife's having an affair. I was like, well, what 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 gives you that reason? She can't account for her whereabouts last Thursday. And I'm sitting thinking, yeah, that's because she was sitting in that fucking chair where you're sitting last Thursday. So, but I can't say things like that, Of obviously. I can't say things like that. Nor can I say to him things like, hey, and, and obviously I'm not going to use her real name, but I can't say, so um, So anyway, so how's, uh, how's, how's Jennifer? Because... He wouldn't know that I that I know that he would know that um, that 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 he's married. I would know that. So he was telling me that he thinks his wife's having an affair and stuff, and so we're, we're having to reassure that. And then a week later, his wife would come in. They were working inside different organisations, and they, I'd love to be able to be able to tell you about this woman, because. She was an unbelievably good source. She'd been doing it for a long, long time. Unbelievably good at, at her job. Um, but that's really all I can tell you about her. But she would she would also say to me, eh, listen, I think eh, I think my husband thinks I'm having an affair. And I was like, well, why, why, why is that? Oh, it's just and it was it was really complicated to try and get my mind. What, what I can and cannot say, a stupid word coming out would kind of give the game away that, that their husband, their wife or uncle or nephew or niece are all working for British intelligence. But it was it was one of the things that the IRA were, were most terrified about. They were terrified about it. And they had every right to be because um, there were sources in that organisation at the highest level, the highest level, and had been working for years and years and years. And when it came out that they'd been, they had been sources for, you know, 15, 20 years, it ripped the organization to pieces. It ripped the IRA to pieces. And they, they, it's like, who do we trust? How do we, how do we trust anybody now? That was great for us. And, you know, I I don't know how how in, informed you guys are about about Northern Ireland, but there's a reason why they called it the Dirty War. It was immensely dirty. It was horribly immoral. People were. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm and I'm not just talking about the 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 people that were killed, the soldiers, the police officers, the um, the civilians that were killed. I don't really care about the terrorists that were killed. Quite frankly, they were all scumbags. But it was it was it was a horribly immoral job. Intelligence work generally is, but especially human intelligence work. Um, you know, you're more or less exploiting people. You're using people. Uh, you're pushing people out their comfort zone. You're training people because we spent a lot of time training them. And we we spent a lot of money in trying to get them promoted within that organisation. How to how they can help, and we we would give them a lot of mentorship on that. Listen, how about doing this, or how about trying that, or you know. But we um, it it, it was it it was sometimes it was. I never found it immoral. I'm 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 telling you right now. I never found it immoral. Other people would. You know how we used these people and how we and what we got out of them and what happened to them. Me personally, I always slept well at night, and and kind of have done ever since. Afghanistan was different. Afghanistan was different because of well, one because of what you said. You can't be covert in Afghanistan. No, I I not me. I can't. I can be low profile. I can be discreet. But I can't be covert because as soon as somebody asks me something, I can't fucking answer. And therefore, you are not covert. 
The reason I found Afghanistan more difficult was it's the only place I've deployed to that got under my skin. It got under my skin. And and I and I did and I didn't understand it. And I had been in Iraq, I had been in Libya, I had I'd been in Sri Lanka, I had and to this day, I, I don't know why. I, I, um, I was in Kandahar the whole time. I was in Kandahar, um, different provinces, Ed Chuck. So I was in, I was in a Zare, Panjwe, uh, Masumgar, Maiwand, the Argandab. Um, so I, I kind of used to jump around with my team down there um, and do um, do some, you know, human recruiting, uh, debriefing, stuff like that. But But I wasn't covert. Um, because I had an Afghan team with me, uh, and um, it was it was originally well, it wasn't originally. It was supposed to be a a, a mentoring program only, but um, everyone went out in the ground. Everybody, everybody that I know went out in the ground, went um, went out with their teams, because there's no better way to mentor somebody than actually doing the job. <laughs> And you, you know, when we're talking about leadership and how we, um, how you get people to follow you, how you get people to trust you, you don't get people to trust you by sending people out to do stuff while you sit back in the fob. You know, that's that's not how you get people to trust you. That's not how you get people to to, to follow you. So, I had no problem with with kind of you know breaking the rules. I say that now because the program's gone, dead and gone, as all as all capacity programs do. Um, but at the time, I, I I would never tell anybody that I was doing it because I've I've probably got fired. And to well, this probably day, because you can't you can't figure it out, right? I mean, Afghanistan is one of those countries where it's it seems very simple, but the culture there is so overly complex that and everywhere you go in Afghanistan is completely different. It's almost like you're in a completely different country half the time. You go from Helmand, you know, over to Kabul, and it's completely different from the terrain to the people, and it's just, it's just hard to wrap your head around anything there. I, I sometimes wonder if, if, if it's, so I've, I've always read about Afghanistan even before I went there, and there's a, there's two great books that I, I recommend anybody to read. One is the Great Game, and it's a, it's a true story. It's this wonderful wonderful like boys adventure story of the 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 british army or the east india company should i say because it was the east india company um and their expansion into afghanistan because they were so paranoid about russians russia expansion down into afghanistan and just to give you a, a quick taster of this book, so they sent these, the East India Company sent these young officers, you know, 19, 20 years old, and they sent them into Afghanistan. And nobody had ever mapped areas or nobody had really ever been in Afghanistan. We're talking, we're talking now the first British war in Afghanistan was maybe 1843. 1844, 45, and they sent these um, young British officers into into Afghanistan uh, to either to build relationships with the with warlords and 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 people like that to try and and uh, build trade deals because that was the idea was that if if they become allies then the Russians can't make them allies, but that's not how Afghans work. You and I know this. We all know, the three of us know this. That's not how Afghans work. Afghans have never been like that. Afghans, mm -hmm. if there was a, and I say this with the with the utmost respect, I mean, I wish I wish we could all do that. If there was a an Olympic sport for when, for knowing when to jump ship and knowing when to change sides, Afghanistan would win the gold medal every four years, every four years. So at the same time, and they were also going out to 
to recce routes. What routes did they, did they think that the Russians would take if they wanted to come down and invade in India and, you know, for the, the whole Silk Route and stuff like that? And the great game was an intelligence game. And there's these great stories of these young guys and they come back seven years later. They come back and they look Afghan. They've got big beards, their, their, their skin is, they look about 50 years old, but they're like 27. And they can speak fluent, they don't know, Dari, Pashto and all the other dialects back then. But by that time, the East India Company had been disbanded because Queen Victoria was getting a little bit pissed off with how, uh, with how powerful they were becoming. And when they, when these officers came back, some of them never came back. Some of them died, and some of them were killed. But when these officers came back, nobody knew who they were because nobody had ever heard of them. And it goes through all the wars. You know, eighteen the eighteen forties, the eighteen seventies, and then the last one, um, sort of nineteen nineteen, and uh, and all three wars. I think it's fair to say us Brits got our ass handed to us three times, uh, quite severely. And uh, did you ever read uh, the Malachi and Field Force by Churchill? No, I haven't. I haven't, but I've heard of that book, and I've, I've never, I've never read that book. No, another great story. British gets their ass handed to them, but it's. Yep. I, I, and I, I would feel disappointed at the way that, 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 you know, the British, the Americans, NATO, everybody, the way that they handled Afghanistan, the way that, that it was all handled back in, you know, 2001, because we should have known better. We should have known better. And it's crazy that all the knowledge that we should have gained from history we kind of just, and then the result of that was that debacle in Afghanistan that that, um, that took the lives of all these marines and, and sailors. That's that's kind of the result for me. That is that's indicative of 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 how we all, America, Great Britain, Canada the European Union countries, how we all handled Afghanistan. I mean, if if we were being marked on that by someday, we would all have failed. We would have failed because of the way we handled it. And um, when I think about it, and, and sometimes in those terms, I, I get angry. I get angry about it because... There was so much, so much lives, so many lives lost, so much money spent, so much, so many bullshit programs and projects. Um, that, and and we, and I think I think the I think the Afghans I think that we 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 treated them terribly. We 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 treated them like children. We treated them with, I don't think with with any respect whatsoever. I think we'll sort of look down our nose at them a little bit that we didn't, no, you guys can't do this. You guys, you know, you need to, um, uh, you need to fight wars the way that we fight them. It's like you're joking, right? Afghans have been fighting wars before America and Great Britain were even countries. Afghans have been fighting wars and winning wars I mean, the country's never been conquered. Isn't that the most bizarre thing? The country's never been conquered. And then we're gonna go in there and right guys, this is a this is how you're gonna how you're gonna war fight now. Crazy. I I I could never quite get my head around that. And I and 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 I don't know whether it's that British connection, especially to Kandahar, my one. The, the I mean the old British fort is still there. Um, and bizarrely enough, quite a lot of red-haired kids cutting around southern Kandahar. I don't know whether that goes back to as far as, as the British, or maybe it's the Russians. I don't know, but it wasn't me. And they, I was there for six years. 
and I used to go home every every my my rotation with the with the DOD was a a hundred a hundred days in country and then thirty days home. So in six years, I was I was like home three months a year. Um, and whenever I was home, I couldn't wait to get back. And whenever I was in Afghanistan, I couldn't wait to get home. And I never, I never found my middle ground. And and I and I, I and, and there was times that I loved it. I loved Afghanistan. I loved it. There was some moments that I just loved it. I I, I thought, you know what, I could. Wait, I, I actually talked about with with some friends of mine about um. Why don't we set up like a an a, a, a adventure junkie tourism high risk tourism Do you know we, we 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 pick up rich tourists that want to go and see religious sites and or, or, or something like that and we just and we just convoy them across the desert and stuff like that you know charge them about 30 grand each and they and just do that or even setting up an adventure training company because afghanistan's got it all you can skydive, you can ski, you can hike, you can mountain bike, you can dirt bike, you can horse ride. You can more or less do everything there. Do you know? But um, I, 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 but I just I don't know why I don't know why it got under my skin so much. Um. But but it did, and it and it made me angry, and it made me angry when I came home, when in my thirty days when I came home. Um, and I think, you know, we, 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 I mean, I can talk about the IRA being cruel. The Taliban and in, in, in the in AQ, they took and and ISIS. I mean, we we were we we, we were reporting um, the presence of ISIS in Afghanistan as far back as two thousand and twelve, and nobody fucking listened to us. Far far back as two thousand and twelve. And when when um, when we sent all these reports up, it was just like laughed at. Was just like thrown in somebody's in somebody's entry, and then lo and behold, what happens? So, but it was a level of cruelty. I, I'd never. I I don't think I'd ever really seen such cruelty from people, and um, such cruelty inflicted upon another human being in the most old testament of ways just horribly horribly cruel graphic um and that 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 made me angry i used to come home and, and obviously the people and i'm sure it was the same in the usa you never ever you never ever get the true the true picture of 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 war you never really get it and they uh, my sister was a um, was one of those people that, that if any anything bad that happens in the world and it's on the news, my sister would kind of be tripping over herself to go and turn the TV off so that she could. Um, she didn't want that in her house. She didn't want um, her daughter, my my niece, hearing those evil bad things. Didn't didn't want anything like evil. Now the the, the problem with that is that you end up being in a bubble. So when I came home, I used to, um, I used to feel very resentful, very angry. And I lived at, at the time, because half half my time in Afghanistan, I was still living in Sri Lanka, and the other time we'd we'd moved back to Scotland. And but rural Scotland, I mean, very rural, picturesque, small village, touristy village in Scotland, beautiful though. But I, I found myself becoming very angry with people for no reason. And I, I found myself being very resentful of their lives being so easy and the bullshit stuff they, they were complaining about. And I could feel that anger starting to build in me. And I, and it was, a, it was probably the first time that I'd felt it. I, I, I hadn't really felt it after, you know, Iraq or uh or libya or, or and even northern ireland i hadn't even felt it but i felt it in afghanistan coming back from afghanistan i felt it 
And I used to look at all these people walking around their, 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 doing their normal daily lives with absolutely no idea the, 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 the level of evil that's out there, the level of, and they're complaining about because the, the local council hasn't fixed a pothole in the road or they're complaining that, that you know, some other bullshit thing, the price of bread in the co-op is, is you know, it's, it's two pence dearer than it was last week. And I found myself becoming very, very angry, stuff like that. So I kind of withdrew a little bit. I lived outside the um, the town. I lived about three miles outside the town in a beautiful, beautiful old house. And it was very remote. And uh, I had my kids, I had my wife, and I had my dogs, and I had my garden. And I had, I had never really taken up gardening before. And I took up gardening and that was, I would spend, if I wasn't in the garden, I would be up in the hills with my dogs for, you know, six, eight hours a day. I, I, we used to have four dogs. So just, just throw them in the back and get up and I'd be up just hill walking in, in all weathers just to get away from people. And of course, my, my, my family were, my sister, her husband, my mother, um, uh, her her husband, who she'd married years years earlier, and all the all the other kids, the nephews and nieces and stuff, they all they all lived in in that in that same little town. And then it, it, it just used to get people asking, why well, why why is Neil not coming to see us? Why is Neil not coming down? Why is Neil? Why is Neil? Why this? Why that? And 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 that that used to make me angry. And I can remember, um, I think the one, I think what, what put me over the edge, I think was, um, I'd went to my, I, I, I love my sister. I love her to death. We don't, we don't speak very often. Um, but um, I remember where I was at my sister's house and we, we, we were, it was a sort of dinner party type thing, but it was about four or five of us left at, at the kitchen table. We're on, on about our fourth or fifth glass of wine and they, my sister's husband said to me, and when, I, and when I say this, Chuck, I know that I know that what's going to get through your head. So my, my sister's husband said to me, um, so Neil, what's Afghanistan really like? And I thought, and I, and I kind of looked at my sister and, they, and I looked back at, back at him and I was like, well, um, do you want, do you want the the edited fluffy version, or do you want what it, what it was actually like? What it's actually like from you know from my perspective? It was a little bit of a dick answer. I, I was being quite argumentative, but but it was just the condescending way that it, that the question was asked. What's it really like in Afghanistan? I was like, well, what do you fucking think it's like? So anyway, I said, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, you know, how I'm going to give you what Afghanistan's like. And I told him, I told him the story about a, a, a source of mine. And I won't go into the, the, into the big long story, but he was a source. He was a source of mine, but he was handed to me by the US human teams who were all about 19 years old, do you know? And, and, I'm, and I'm thinking, yeah, you wonder why? You wonder why you can't get anything out of this guy? You know, you, you've, you've, got, you've got 19, 20, 21 year old so called humanters working a 55 year old Taliban guy. That's why. Or he, he wasn't Taliban, he was on the periphery. He was handed over and we, um, we trained him and, and took him through some, 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 some tradecraft. And he was um, coming back from a wedding in Helmand and he was traveling up back up to Kandahar City where he worked and he was stopped by a Chechen Taliban group. And we knew there were Chechens that were working down south and they, and I, I, I won't go into any, 
So they took him out of the car. He was traveling with his wife. He was traveling with his nine-year-old son. Um, they, they shot his wife in the head and then they skinned and beheaded his son in front of him before they shot him. I, I couldn't get in touch with him. We were, we were trying to get in touch with him. I knew he was coming back up. We were, we were due to meet because of where he had been. And they, he would usually get in touch when he, when he came back and he didn't. And we were trying to get in touch, trying to get in touch. Um, and then we, um, we got a report in of this almost like an atrocity. It was the NDS that, that, um, that I spoke to because we had, we had a, we had a very good relationship with the NDS. And um, so we jumped in some vehicles, we went out and they, because they had said, this might be your guy. Um, so we had, we had we jumped in some vehicles, we went out and um, and and it was. And it turns out that, um, and unbeknown to me, and, and to this day, I don't know, I, I don't know whether or not uh, I, I should have picked up on this, but I just didn't know. He was given a coin by the US Army. He was given a coin when he, just before he was handed over to us or to me. I never knew he had the coin. And this guy had this coin in his pocket everywhere. He he seen it as like a great honor that he was he was given this coin by by US forces. And um we, we later learned that he would, it, it, it didn't matter where he was, he would pull it out and show people to try as, as some, some weird way of saying, I'm, I'm well respected. And, and he, would, he would show it to people. And we think he showed it to the wrong people. Um, so anyway, so I, I told I told my, my sister and her husband about that, um, about how they had they had um, they had skinned this boy, like the way that you would skin a goat. And I, I I didn't even I didn't even know it was possible to skin a human being. I know it, I know that, that that you know you see it in horror movies and stuff like that. I didn't actually think it was possible to, to be done. It was like how do how do you actually do that? But this this guy this this um, this kid's um, uh, uh, the skin on his legs had been had been peeled back like a banana, and um, and they had been beheaded, uh, and that 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 was for me. That was my 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 turning point with with that question. What's it like in Afghanistan? Because when I when I started telling this story, my sister my sister was saying, "Nope, nope, don't want to hear it. Don't want to hear it. Nope, stop, stop, stop." Don't want to hear it. And that's kind of, for me, that was indicative of the UK 